Ever since the birth of the vehicle, there have been folks needing their transportation fixed. From horses needing shoes, to firebox rebuilding, to adjusting the push rods, to just changing a fuel filter. Whether biological or mechanical, the transportation we humans rely on all needs maintenance and care. And for automobiles, that's been a source of competition. On the one hand, manufacturer-associated dealers, on the other, independent dealers, and on a uh, third hand, uh, what am I, species 8472? On a third hand, home mechanics. But as cars have got smarter, shade tree mechanics and those little independent garages have had less and less access to the complex diagnostic data that vehicles provide, and auto manufacturers have made accessing the specialist tools needed to work on these vehicles harder and harder. So does the EV mean the death of repairs outside the dealer network? But first, Transport Evolved is completely independent and impartial. We're funded by YouTube ad revenue, outside production work, and awesome viewers just like you. Hit subscribe, like, and stick around to the end of the video to find out how to support the channel. EVs certainly aren't the first vehicles to need specialist equipment and training to perform repairs. I mean, Citroen's hydro pneumatic suspension and BMC's hydroelastic suspension both require proprietary equipment and they date from the 50s and 60s. The delightful and yet tiny Fiat Cinquecento had a list of special tools longer than War and Peace, and fault finding on most modern vehicles is frequently near impossible without, at the very least, an OBD dongle, and in many cases a specific computer that's tied to the individual manufacturer. But EVs may have accelerated the transition to specialist diagnostic tools, not because they have much more complex onboard computer systems, but just because of the timing of their emergence into the mass market. Tesla has made absolutely no bones about its desire to keep repairs in-house, and even simple repairs can be challenging because of the way that the onboard systems in the car identify even small components, like the steering wheel switchgear. See our video going to more depth about that here, or in the link below. But as automakers increasingly add features that are software locked, that is, the hardware is in the car but you need to pay a fee, sometimes a subscription to have it turned on, then the need to lock down the software systems of the car becomes more pressing. With the advent of automakers pitching the car as a living space, excuse me, I just need to pop out and wash my mouth out with bleach. That's better, sorry. How will you get your customers to subscribe to, I don't know, the lava lamp function if they can just hack in and turn it on with their iPhone? More seriously, it's hard to charge $20 a month for remote heating access if someone can just come along with an OBD dongle and an Android app and flip the bit that allows you to have control over that feature. And the same for more expensive self-driving and autonomous features. And with the reduced maintenance and repair cost of EVs, which eat into automakers and dealers' extremely lucrative spares and service markets, manufacturers are incentivized to find other ways to keep that money rolling in. So they're keen to find ways to extract value from you. Making it harder and harder for anyone not in the manufacturer's ecosystem to repair the vehicles has multiple benefits for them. I mean, not for you, it, it sucks for you, but for them, they get the money from the parts, money from the franchise for being a franchise, money from the franchise for the subscription to the super secret software that you need, money for training, money for the special equipment they require the franchise to buy to be approved to service the vehicle. And as a little cherry on top, because getting your car fixed at a dealership is likely to be more expensive, you might be tempted to replace it earlier and they can upsell you on a new car from the same manufacturer. What's not to like? As a result, and as it stands with some vehicles, taking them to an independent mechanic is difficult and may well bring forth the good old bold the builder line. Can we fix it? No. It's f- 
And that might just be a problem for you or I, but anti-circumvention laws that prevent you tinkering with what you own can be disastrous for some. Farmers, who sometimes have a very short window where the weather is right to gather crops, can find that a software locked tractor breaks. And while they can physically fix it, they can't get it moving without the relevant technician plugging in a dongle, which is made for unlikely bedfellows in the right to repair movement. Unsurprisingly, with a lot of money at stake and some very deep pockets, the fight has got somewhat dirty, with Ground Zero in the US being largely Massachusetts, or as I call it, the Sunshine State. Hey, if I keep calling states the Sunshine State, I'll eventually get it right. Back in 2012, the good folk of Massachusetts decided to ignore the pleas of automakers. Won't you please think of our bank accounts? and the massive amounts of money thrown into lobbying, and instead passed legislation that requires vehicle owners and independent repair facilities in Massachusetts to have access to the same vehicle diagnostic and repair information made available to the manufacturer's Massachusetts dealers and authorised repair facilities. Worse, that law prompted the build-out of a nationwide agreement that meant that auto repair shops across the US gained access to specialised hardware and software that had, up until that point, been under the sole purview of automakers and their dealerships. But then things started to get tricky because vehicles started to transmit data wirelessly. And as a result, supporters of the right to repair and independent mechanics realised that automakers could stop sending repair information to the diagnostic ports, requiring connections to the cloud or wireless subsystems to extract that information. That would have fallen outside the scope of the 2012 law and locked customers back into the dealership network. But then despite manufacturers and dealers telling the people of Massachusetts, NO, again, the folks there voted in 2020 to mandate that automakers share onboard telematics data that they've been so jealously guarding and storing in the cloud. Any vehicle sold there which, quote, collects and wirelessly transmits mechanical data to a remote server, end quote, was included. And this is where things start to get messy, because that law required that automakers make that information accessible using a third-party open data platform, which as of yet doesn't exist. Now, some might uncharitably suggest that if automakers really wanted to comply with the law, they'd have got on with building such a system instead of filing suit to prevent the initiative taking effect. But since most automakers would rather sell you their grandmother than give away such information without an order signed in triplicate, sent in, sent back, queried, lost, found, subjected to public inquiry, lost again and finally buried in soft peat for three months and recycled as fire lighters, attempting to block the law coming into effect and thereby reducing the danger of that sort of contagion spreading to other states and countries seems to have been the priority. And obviously, the system isn't built yet. Of course, at this point, automakers are, to be fair, in a tricky spot, and Kia and Subaru are at the forefront of the fight, having opted to turn off telematics and remote features for vehicles sold in Massachusetts. Want preheating or want your car to schedule its timing? You're not controlling that remotely there. Subaru's director of corporate communication stated that, quote, this was not to comply with the law. Compliance with the law at this time is impossible, but rather to avoid violating it." End quote. Kia have so far stayed stum on the issue, just stiffing purchases in the Bay State with a less functional vehicle. So how will this play out? That's unclear right now. The litigation is still wending its way through the courts and a decision is expected this coming month. The argument from automakers is that opening a car's mechanical data to anyone is dangerous and might be in violation of federal law. The trade group, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, states that the federal government, not states, should control who gets access to cars' telematic systems. And certainly, as modern vehicles transmit more and more data back to their makers, it does seem that automakers may have something of a point about underestimating the amount of data that's being collected with vehicles no longer just identifying low tyre pressure or blown light bulbs and instead transmitting everything from granular location and driving data through biometrics for the driver and weather conditions, filtering through that to identify exactly what could be necessary for fault finding and also coming to an agreement about that across multiple automakers 
it's going to be complex and challenging, and take some time, if it's even truly feasible. That said, the Massachusetts Right to Repair Committee, which represents over 1,600 repair shops, states that automakers had plenty of time to prepare. And while the argument that insufficient time was available might be deemed to have merit, Massachusetts lawmakers have already proposed at least three bills that would amend the law to extend the time for compliance till modern year 2025, something which may not bring great joy to automakers' hearts. Then again, it might all be moot. In 2021, the Biden administration directed the Federal Trade Commission to write rules, making it easier for consumers to access their own data and repair tools. Some right to repair advocates hope that the rules will extend to vehicles, which may mean that the Massachusetts law ends up being at least somewhat redundant. But for those of us who like to own the things we own, not borrow them, and who like to tinker and improve or just plain fix the things they own themselves, this is definitely a fight to keep an eye on. We're expecting a ruling from the court this month, so we'll keep you up to date. That's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link below. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ding to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Assuming that YouTube starts doing that again. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tesla in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Rory Litwin, Anonymous Freak, Jim Burness, Zachary Courtney, Chris Asenta, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, John Lyons, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Ellery Hensley, and Ian. Want your name in that list? You can join our Patreon at the link below. Support us using YouTube Join, which is also down below, or show us your love through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are all down there. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving. Mm -hmm.